Hello everyone and welcome to Politics Today on Channels Television. I'm Sean Joaquin Baloye. It's 7 p.m. here in Lagos, Nigeria and all eyes are in Washington, D.C. in the United States where the next American president will operate from for the next four years and noon in Wisconsin, one of the battleground states in the U.S. where the election is going down to the wire. And as of now, no clear winner in the race we are voting and that yesterday we are understanding that a president then and its campaign had vowed to request recount in Wisconsin. A battleground said has not been called yet. The Democratic candidate Joe Biden remains hopeful. President Donald Trump is has claimed victory in the country's presidential election, vowing to launch a Supreme Court challenge over allegations of fraud and vote counting. Millions of votes remain uncounted, and no candidate can credibly claim victory at the moment. But some good news and jubilation in the camps of some Americans of Nigerian descent will have won seat in the American Parliament. Some Africans running for office in the United States have emerged winners. Two of them are Nigerian Americans who are part of nine others in the race. They are Oye Owolewa and Esther Agbaje. Oye Owolewa, who holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in pharmacy, contested to represent the District of Columbia on the platform of the Democratic Party. Esther Agbaje is seeking to represent District and Finance 59B in the Minnesota House of Representatives on the platform of the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party, an affiliate of the U.S. Democratic Party. It's interesting. Uh, we'll have a just five minute drive from my village in Kwara State, uh, where he's, uh, he hears from. Uh, good news there. But tonight on the program, we shall be looking at the issues raised after the Inspector General of Police disbanded the Special Anti Robbery Squad. And now the new tactical team, SWAT, has begun training. The Minister of Police Affairs is a guest on the program tonight. And the matter uh, before us is to look at the preparations and what has changed. But first, let's check out some of your other political stories on our Political Roundup. The ministers of the Southwest are asking for support from the CBN or any other funding mechanism to support small and medium businesses affected by the looting and arson which took place in Lagos and other parts of the country. The ministers were speaking to State House correspondents after the virtual Federal Executive Council meeting, which held at the State House in Abuja. Make recommendations to the federal government to support Lagos State to restore and reconstruct damaged facilities, especially those related to the maintenance of law and order. A federal high court in Abuja has fixed the 16th of November 2020 for hearing in an alleged perjury suit instituted against the governor of Edo State, Mr. Godwin Obaseki, by the All Progressives Congress. Justice Ahmed Mohammed fixed the date after the suit was mentioned. Counsel to the plaintiffs, Mr. Akio Lujimi, then informed the court that the matter was for mention and asked for a definite date for hearing. The suit filed by the All Progressives Congress has Mr. Obaseki, the People's Democratic Party and INEC as defendants. Counsel to Mr. Obaseki, however, informed the court that he had filed a motion on notice challenging the competence of some processes contained in the suit. The Coalition of Northern Groups has criticized the Northern Governors Forum for what it describes as its failure to address the more serious issues of insecurity, unemployment, poverty and dwindling fortunes of agriculture and general economic decline at their recent meeting in Kaduna State. The group says rather than focus on what they describe as important issues, they criticize the governors for focusing attention on the NSARS protests and social media regulation, which according to them are less important to the development of the region. The agenda for the NGF meeting was grossly misplaced in the sense that it accorded more relevance to the NSARS and the social media failings, which should by far not be the major focus for concern for the North at the moment. 
The National Industrial Court has ordered the Kogi State Government to pay the former Deputy Governor Simon Achuba the sum of 180 million Naira as outstanding security votes from April 2018 to August 2019 within 30 days or pay 30% interest every month. However, Mr. Achuba's prayer that he be paid the sum of 328 million Naira as his entitled impressed was dismissed as read by Justice Oye Biola Oye Wumi. The Judicial Panel of Inquiry inaugurated by the National Human Rights Commission to investigate alleged abuses by the defunct Special Anti-Robbery Squad has commenced sitting at the FCT High Court. Speaking at the inaugural sitting of the panel, its chairman, Justice Suleiman Galadima, says that a total of 148 petitions have been received so far. He reiterates the commitment of the committee to ensure that justice is served to all parties. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been over two weeks now since the Inspector General of Police disbanded the Embato Special Anti-Robbery Squad, popularly called SARS, and a new tactical unit set up named uh, SWAT appears to have gotten a boost for its operations. The new police unit called Special Weapons and Tactics Unit, SWAT, have begun its training. The development is coming after many young Nigerians began an online agitation over police brutality and eye-handedness of some of the officials of the SWAT team, which then got onto the street and it became a very uh, wide nationwide uh, protest. But how far are the plans for this new initiative and the agitations of Nigerians? Let's speak with the Minister of Police Affairs, Mohamed Dingyadi, who joins us from our Buddha studio. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for joining us tonight on the program. Um, we've seen some uh, videos uh, of the training of uh, uh, this SWAT team. And perhaps we should um, uh, clear some, um, do some uh, uh, clari uh, getting clarity on some of the issues that are brought on the table. How many altogether, because we understand that we have different uh, uh, of uh, the, the, the different groups in different, we have about four uh, training centers. Altogether, how many are the, uh, the SWAT members or the of officers? How many are, them, are they all together? Uh, thank you very much for having me, uh, Mr. Oshun. Uh, I want to also thank the management of uh, Channels Television for giving me this opportunity for creating this platform for me to come and talk about these very important issues that are very dear to my ministry and to the government of uh, President Muhammad Buhari. I thank you very much for that. Uh, to go straight to the question that you are asking, uh, I'm sure you must have seen that I was uh, in Ende Hills about two days ago. Uh, I visited the, the training school and uh, I met the trainees. I think the trainees there are about uh, uh, 1,200 and uh, they have about, I think, about 10 days now and are going this training exercise. So, I mean, from uh, uh, the one in Nasarawa, uh, because we understand that there are other centers, so the one in Nasarawa has about 1,000, is it? Yes. But what about the, uh, the others? What about the others in other centers? How many do we have generally, altogether? We have about... Uh, 4,000 altogether. And the other, the remaining uh, participants are in Oshun State and are going a similar training. So uh, the videos that we have seen, Honorable Minister, show the physical training the new SWAT team are undergoing. But how are you uh, in their training addressing the problem of ethics? Because that was one of the issues that got Nigerians agitated. And the attitudes of the police towards the public, which is a salient concern of many Nigerians. 
You see, these are issues that are already embodied in the reforms that we are going to conduct, or we are going to uh, uh, engage ourselves into. Uh, the issue that actually uh, brought about this end such protest are uh, issues of uh, overdoing the activities of the SARS uh, unit that was disbanded. Like you also said, uh, they have to do with uh, ethics. They also have to do with the uh, orientation and the behavior of the officers who are in charge uh, in these activities. So what, what we are trying to do now is in the course of the training, we are trying to teach the SWAT uh, trainees the need to ensure that they appreciate the fact that they are there out to protect Nigerians, and we expect them to be good ambassadors of the police family, wherever they are. And uh, we expect them also to show uh, a very high sense of decorum, to show a lot of humility, to appreciate the fact that they are there to protect the people they are working for. I think this is very important, and uh, we have always said it, and we have asked our instructors to continue to educate and to remind these trainees that these are the jobs that should be on top of the gear and when they find themselves in the places they are going to be posted. So, uh, Honorable Minister, please tell us, the speed at which the NSAS was disbanded, and a few days later, we saw that the Inspector General had announced that there is another tactical team, and they are going to be going on the training. Is the syllabus of the training, is it all uh, already in the training manual of the Nigerian Police Training School, or this is a new uh, training uh, the syllabus altogether? Because if it's a new tactical team, that means that it's uh, a new orientation generally. No, you see, uh, many people have expressed the view that you have expressed. But uh, we need to understand one thing. Uh, this issue of security is at every hour there. And uh, we have to take steps to ensure that we uh, fill in the gap. And that is why we quickly uh, went ahead to, re -establish, to establish a new unit that will replace SARS. And uh, to do this, they have to go undergo this kind of training. And uh, we don't see any rush or any harm in going ahead to set up the uh, new unit because uh, you have to do it and uh, we, we need to do it as quickly as we can to ensure that this gap is filled in because the assignment being conducted by SARS before they were disbanded is there to be performed by somebody. So we, we need to quicken the process to ensure that there is a unit in place that is, and, uh, that is in charge of these things. But, but we cannot just take them to the field to fill in the gap without training them and without giving them the new reorientation, without giving them the new rules, the new order, so that uh, they don't go and repeat the same mistakes that SARS have done. So um, training on one hand, so I mean, so let's get it clearly, um, Honorable Minister. So their training or right. the module for their training is an existing training that you, that you have already in your system. You see, uh, no, mod no model is uh, static. Of course, there is a model for the training because the functions are almost similar. But we need to take cognizance of what is happening in the 21st century and build it into the training as it goes along. Okay, great. So now I, I'm looking at it after the training because what a lot of people, the fears a lot of people have uh, brought up is the fact that the attitude and the approach of uh, the SARS operatives in the manner in which they uh, brandished weapons and all of that, what kind of weapons? Because a lot of people wonder why they carry uh, AK-47 on the street as against those kind of communication gadgets that you find police officers carry in other climes. Have you prepared some specialized weapon and gadgets for them to use? You see, we have a plan to, let me say in the first place, the AK-47 that you are talking about 
as far as this era is concerned, I think we are satisfied with the way it is being used and uh, we have no intention at this material time to change the weapon that they are using. But uh, with the trend, changing trend of crimes in this uh, century, we may consider the possibility of uh, giving them new types of weapons that you said you have seen in other places. We have the intention of uh, getting better equipment, but for now, we are going to continue with the AK-47, and we think AK-47 will serve the purpose for which our policemen are given the assignment to perform. So, because a lot of people wonder, and experts will tell you that um, seeing police officers uh, carry guns on the street uh, perhaps may not be needed. What is needed most of the time is intelligence and the communications to, in the first place, prevent the crime. And then, you, of course, you use the weapon to run after criminals. Uh, one of the criticisms is uh, how the police officers communicate and the kind of manner in which they gather intelligence. Are you rethinking that architecture? No, you see, you are absolutely right, because uh, what is needed, if you go to advanced countries, you don't see policemen walking around with uh, guns, because the technology is there. It is using guns, it will be the last resort. So uh, we, we are on top of the situation, and the uh, issue of technology, we are going to tackle it because these are things that Mr. President has given very clear directives for us to pursue. And we are on top of the situation. Uh, I want to assure Nigerians that the uh, issue of technology is of great concern to us. And we are going to address it squarely by the grace of God. How soon can we be seeing these technologies that you are talking about? Oh, very soon, very soon, very soon. You see, uh, Mr. President has uh, uh, directed the setting of this police trust fund uh, because all these issues are related with paucity of funds, insufficient funding for the Nigerian police. And Mr. President has clearly uh, noted this and has uh, set out machinery in motion to establish the police trust fund, which is already in place. And uh, very soon, by the time their budget is approved, we will start to uh, procure most of this equipment that we are talking about. But uh, quickly, before we go on our first break on the program, Minister, are all the new SWAT team members volunteers, or were any of them conscripted to join the force? No, no, no. They are our policemen and the women in this country, and we selected them based on merit, and they are now undergoing the training. So, uh, so they are it, not it, volunteers? It's, it's, it's based on a selection process. No oh, volunteers so at all. It, they are not volunteers because, I mean, in, in some other clients, experts have said, look, volunteers tend to be better motivated because that's one of the pitfalls or some of the problems of SARS. The selection process, a, lot, a former IG had told us that there is corruption in part of the selection process. So volunteering is one of the models uh, that experts say it could, be, it could work. So there are no volunteers amidst the SWAT team members. No, you see, uh, what, what we have done is to ask the state police commissioners to select suitable candidates who will go for this training. It's, it's based on so many factors. One, somebody has to be healthy to undergo the training. You have to be fit, and you have to be willing and ready to contribute a quota in the development of this country as far as this area is concerned. So, so there is, it's not anything voluntary as such, but the consent of the participants is also of paramount importance to us because uh, they all know where they are going, and they have accepted to go for the training. So we've been talking about... The, the SWAT, the new uh, anti-robbery and the special uh, squad that uh, the IG had set, put together. And you have told us that they were put together uh, through a selection process. So 
Talk us through the psychological or the syllabus of uh, training them, the psychological certification of the new SWAT team. Um, uh, the question is, will it be a new face? How does their syllabus look like? Talk us through. Uh, you see, you see uh, like I said earlier on, the syllabus are not anything different from what we used to train uh, people of this kind of set and uh, uh, so, so the slippers, syllabus are actually the same but they are a reflection also of uh, the 21st century, they are a reflection of what we have witnessed in the last few weeks and uh, they, they are intended to take cognizance of all these developments that we should learn from and uh, by the time they finish we would expect them to be a better set of police officers who will be dealing with armed robbery in this country. Uh, what is most important is approach to situations. And uh, we are giving greater attention to this issue of reorientation to ensure that they know what they are doing and to ensure that they know what to do and the right way to do it. And uh, on top of it all, what is important is the humility that is attached to it as policemen. They are supposed to be humane, they are supposed to be as democratic as possible, as civil as possible. And these are some of the things that we are trying to impart in them in the course of the assignment they are expected to perform. Another issue is the intelligence capacity. Uh, did they go through any kind of tests or they were just selected and thrown into that training, uh, intelligence cap capacity to respond to distress calls, and training on when to shoot and the usage of weapons. Now, don't forget, all these people who are selected are all uh, conventional police officers who have gone undergone all this training process that you are talking about. They are aware of all these things, and uh, uh, we just thought we should take them to a more rigorous training that will put them through what we want them to do. But they are all conventional police officers who have gone through this rudimental training of uh, using how to use their arms and ammunition, how to approach situations of that nature. I think we will not have any problem with that. Uh, will these SWAT team members, will they be on a special salary or a special wage because you are saddling them with special duties? No, it's not like that. They are going to uh, earn the usual salary skills that are being earned by every police officer. But we are aware that Mr. President has already directed that uh, a new salary structure be put out for the police officers in this country to be commensurate with the duties they are performing. So, so it's going to be the same salary structure. The only difference is that the, every police officer is assigned to a different duty. And... Uh, the duty they are performing is different from the others, but the salary is the same. So, uh, who would they be answerable to directly? Would the new SWAT team operate under the direct control of the IG office, or will they be under the commissioner, uh, commissioners of police in the state commands? No, they will be under the state commissioners of police in the commands they are operating. And... Uh, uh, from time to time, if need be, the Inspector General will be issuing out directives as to how they operate from time to time, depending on situations and patterns of crimes that are committed from day to day. All right. Uh, Honorable Minister, because another issue on the table is uh, on the manner in which uh, the general reform is going to be, because the SWAT team are just a segment of the entire police uh, structure. Will there be any kind of retraining of other police officers? Because the issue of police brutality is not only limited to the SAS, uh, SWAT, I mean, to the SAS uh, members that were disbanded. You see, this training and retraining is an ongoing exercise and it cuts across all units of the police. So it is ongoing and we will continue to do it and we will continue to give it priority attention, particularly with the new uh, police trust fund that has been in place. 
Uh, we are going to work out strategic training programs for all the police officers in this country. Uh, the idea is to ensure that they perform creditably and they excel to the limit of what we expect them to do. And uh, the final intention is to ensure that we have a police that is, uh, uh, I would say, is a... Uh, uh, is uh, within the confines of the law and uh, a police that is, uh, can be comparable to all police men and the women across the globe. All right, Honorable Minister, another very critical question. I understand that the new SWAT team currently undergoing training are all officers. When will the rank and file be recruited for the SWAT team? No, I, I didn't. I didn't say they are all officers. There are there are people from different ranks, and uh, depending on the schedule you are performing, uh, the the ranks are not just from one rank. I think, uh, well, they are fairly senior officers, and uh, uh, the intention is to continue the training and the recruitment uh, as and when necessary. How do you then but, but assure... this kind of assignment, you need... Go ahead, You please. need uh, mature and uh, disciplined and uh, very thorough officers who will perform it. And that's why we are selecting to ensure that uh, we get credible people who will do the job. What is the process of checks and balance within the SWAT structure? Because they say SWAT started very well, but at the end of the day... Things went wrong. How can you ensure or assure Nigerians that the issue of brutality that we saw in SARS will not return or come into the uh, rank and file of the SWAT? You, you see, uh, what actually caused what happened previously was due to lack of supervision and due to lack of initiative on the part of the supervisors and Nigerians themselves. So what, what, we have, what we have learned today, as far as these issues are concerned, is that uh, Nigerians will be involved in the supervision and in the feedback mechanism of what they are doing. And uh, state governments are also going to be uh, reasonably involved in the supervision and uh, interface with police in their various states. So we don't think this kind of thing is going to happen again because uh, uh, we have learned a lot of uh, bitter lessons from what happened about three weeks ago. So everybody will be concerned about how police conduct themselves. And this is going to be a priority thing for us to ensure that not only SWATs, all policemen and women in this country perform within the limit of the law, within the expectations of uh, what they are supposed to do. Uh, with what we've seen now, you said the president has approved uh, the change in the welfare orientation and the scheme of the Nigerian police force. So what is delaying the implementation of the welfare of the police? Now you see, this is, that, that is, in everything you do, that is a process. The stakeholders are there, we need to consult them, and I believe uh, they have their own way of doing things, and they will do it. Let's, let's give them a chance. Uh, and we are pursuing it. I, I believe they, they do some consultation, they take some statistics, and uh, government also needs to know the cost implication of all these things. And uh, since the, the, the Mr. President has given directives, these things are going to be implemented. All we need is the support, cooperation, understand, and the understanding of Nigerians to ensure that these things are done within the shortest possible time. Uh, in... Uh in, in your own, in, in a brief manner, um, Minister, can you talk us through the ingredients and the faces of the reforms that you've talked about? Uh, a lot of Nigerians are hearing the police reforms, but they do not really have an idea of how this is going to be. Talk us through the ingredients of the reforms. You, you see... Uh, many Nigerians are talking about reforms, reforms of the police, but and very few people know what is in the heart of Mr. President, what he is feeling about this policeman in this country, uh, because very few people know 
that since uh, as early as uh, 2019, Mr. President signed into law the 2019 uh, Police Trust Fund Act to see to the various reforms that we expect to implement in the police uh, service in this country. And uh, what is most important in reforming the police is the funding aspect of it. Police in this country have for long been underfunded. We have so many funding gaps, and uh, there are a lot of things that need to be done which have not been done. I think Mr. President saw this a long time ago, and that is why he came up with this police trust fund. And I want to use this opportunity to thank the state governors, the 36 state governors and the FCT for supporting Mr. President and for giving all the needed support and cooperation to ensuring for the smooth take off of this police trust fund. Uh, the fund is already in place and monies have started accruing, like I said, very soon in the next, in a couple of uh, days, the budget of the police trust fund will be approved and they will go into action as to what and what they are supposed to do. The priority things to do is, like you talked about, the technology and uh, the equipment. We have given these priority attention. And uh, the other issues are those of uh, renovating, building police stations, building residences of police men and women, and uh, ensuring that uh, the necessary equipment that are needed for them to work effectively are provided to them. These are some of the reforms that we intend to do. Of course, there are others like uh, the attitudinal orientation of the policemen in this country. Uh, there is also a need for uh, making sure that the structure that we have on the ground is improved to make them more functional and more service-oriented. These are some of the things that we are talking about. And uh, we are bankrolling all these things, and we want to ensure that uh, police in this country uh, seem to be comparable to all other policemen that can be said to be uh, performing effectively. All right, Honorable Minister, to wrap up this conversation, I know Chandra Television had uh, a documentary some time ago about the training school and the uh, state of uh, the facilities and infrastructure at those training schools. Uh, on one hand, I, I'd like you to, in a few seconds, tell us, has anything changed in the last uh, few months or years about those training schools? And on the other hand, is uh, the morale of the Nigerian police officers in the wake of the event that we have seen where they were attacked and uh, their pol uh, some police formations were burned? Yes, you see, it is actually very demoralizing because uh, uh, somebody who is supposed to protect you and you turn around uh, burning his offices, burning his houses, killing some policemen, it is very demoralizing, it is very unfortunate. But uh, these things have happened, they are history, and uh, like I said, we have learned a lot from them. But don't forget, uh, we are not blaming anybody, but uh, people, because we are blaming those who have taken over, who have hijacked these uh, protests. Because the protesters started initially with uh, very good intentions, with uh, very clear motives of uh, seeing to the improvement of services of the police in this country. But suddenly they have started, people who are talking about improving the police have turned out to be burning police stations and the rest of them. So, so you can see the, 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 the contradiction. And that is why many Nigerians, and including those in the diaspora, have agreed that some people have taken over these protests in order to achieve their own ulterior motives. So, but you have seen the Inspector General of Police going around now. Uh, among other things, is there to encourage the police to continue to come out to perform their duties as they have been doing. And uh, I think this is leading positive results. Uh, so so, so we, we are doing whatever we can to encourage the policemen and the women in this country to ensure that they, this doesn't distract them. Uh, the usual uh, monitoring and evaluation and uh, protecting of life and property that they're supposed to perform are, are continued 
in all parts of the country. Honorable Minister of Police Affairs, Mohamed Dingiadi, thank you so much indeed for coming to Tan Nigeria and some of the plans in changing the face of what has become a warring state of the Nigerian police force. Thank you so much. And we do hope that uh, in the next few days or weeks, we shall be seeing those changes. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Well, we switch gears now and uh, talk about uh, election matters. It appears some of the yearnings of Nigerians are getting attention as we look forward to the general elections of 2023. For those who say they would like to register before the election year, and now voter registration, we understand, uh, will begin in the first quarter of 2021. This much was disclosed by the chairman of INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, during the commission's budget defense session with the Senate Committee on INEC. Consequently, the sum of one billion naira has been earmarked for the exercise of continuous voter registration exercise. He's also seeking the approval of the Senate to spend 5.2 billion naira from the special INEC fund to make up for the shortfall in the 2020 budget, which was cut because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Professor Yakubo codes in the National Assembly to amend the Electoral Act to accommodate diaspora and early voting. Take a listen to the INEC chairman. Well, uh, in, for, for continuous voter registration, the commission intends to resume in the first week, uh, sorry, first quarter. The commission intends to resume voter registration in the first quarter of next year. And once we resume, it will be continuous for one and a half years, at least until six months to the next general election. So in other words, we're not going to resume the CBR for a week or two or for a month or two, but we're working out uh, the details. On diaspora voting, you are preaching to the converted. The commission is desirous of giving Nigerians living abroad the right to vote. After all, all our neighboring countries do so. But it requires amendments to the Constitution and the Electoral Act for that to happen. And we have already worked out the documents. Once the law is amended today, we can roll out. It has two dimensions. That is what is called the out-of-country voting OCV, which is for Nigerians serving outside Nigeria, like members of the diplomatic corps, like the technical aid corps, or Nigerian service personnel, army and the police, serving in foreign missions abroad. Then you have the other dimension, which is, I think, what we are talking about. That is voting by Nigerians in the diaspora, meaning Nigerians permanently resident outside the country. We, we are ready. In fact, we had several meetings with the Diaspora Commission led by Ms. Abikeda Biri. So we are ready, but uh, the, we can't go beyond what outside what the law provides. So you heard some of those plans there. If you are living out of Nigeria and you intend to vote, you know what to do now. If you want to register, because a lot of you are saying, get your PVC. Now that you know when you can do that, so you have an idea of what to do. Let's get some clarity and some more information from INEC. I'm now being joined by Mr. Mustafa, uh, Dr. Mustafa Lecky, a national commissioner with INEC. He joins us from Abuja studio. Thank you so much, Dr. Lecky, for your time tonight. Let's begin the conversation. It does sound like a good news. Uh, first and foremost, uh, were you able to get a nod from the National Assembly to get more money? Because you're asking for more money for uh, your budget next year. Was it a positive one today? Uh, thank you, Sheung, for having me. Uh, yeah, this is part of the process that takes place generally during this time of the year when the government is putting the budget together. The agencies will go there to make a defense of their budget. So it was our next time to see the two committees at the Senate as well as in the House to defend the INEC budget. Whether we got enough? No, we didn't get enough. We need more. INEC certainly needs more, but uh, INEC is working within the confines of the envelope given to it, which is about some 40-something billion or so naira, which is really not enough given the sort of plan that INEC has up, up in the slate. So you can also help us to do more of advocacy to make sure INEC gets more money. Okay, um, that, that, needs, uh, that advocacy, we need to uh, talk about that after the program, uh, doctor. Uh, because if you are getting more money, then we'll see how that plays out. <laughs> but let's get to the issue of uh, continuous voter edu education and uh, registration. Um, there are procedures in getting this done. A lot of Nigerians want something that will be every day, where they can just work in, 
and get registered. Uh, but the, uh, the chairman said there that he's going to get from uh, the early 2021 for about a year and a half. But how is this going to happen for anyone who wants to register? What do they need to know uh, from early next year? Well, this is not the first time. I think credit must go to this present commission because this is the first time in, uh, in a particular commission that INEC is truly doing continuous voter registration. Mm -hmm. And you saw a bit of that uh, about a year or so you know, ago. So we're just resetting it and coming back right after the, now that we have the general election 2019, as well as other off-season elections have come you know, and gone. So and as the new year is coming, where you know, INEC is getting ready you know, to commence the continual voters registration. It's a CVR as intended by law. That's what we are doing. But in terms of uh, how easy it's going to be, since we've done this before, it's simply moving forward with the, what we have been doing before. It's a question of agreeing on the date, getting the resources, hoping that the money will come from the um, uh, from National Assembly and the presidency and ANEC will be ready to go. You know, and of course, we'll never have enough money. So we know how to manage with whatever is available by making sure that the equipment that we need are deployed to strategic areas, particularly at the ROA level, and then they can be rotated depending on the needs uh, going forward. So it's uh, something that we, I think has practiced in the past that can you know, take forward. There might be some bit of technological changes going forward, but can, you know, the important is to focus on the fact that the CVR is going to be reset in the first quarter of next year. So uh, the thing is that a lot of people wonder, uh, you have the driver's license, you have the national ID card, you have the international passport. Uh, a lot of people wonder that if you uh, get to the age of 18, that is the official voting age in Nigeria by law, that you should be able to naturally be able to walk into an office. But this time around, I understand that it's going to be the INEC office in the particular world or local government as specified. Have you tried to unify all of this? Because I know the federal government has set up that committee to do that. Uh, is that in process yet? Has that matured just yet? Well, it's not INEX mandate to unify all the legacy, you know, disparate identity, you know, uh, platform that we have in Nigeria, driver's license, NHIS, the INEC registration, you know, work card, and many others, you know, like that. But that is not INEX mandate. But the good thing is that the federal government has put on, uh, has set up a framework, which is the national identity ecosystem, where all these various uh, ID systems can come together and they're working in collaboration, particularly with the National ID, you know, Commission uh, NIMSI, to, to harmonize uh, this, you know, going forward. So, so I know it's going to continue because we have the largest database of over 84 million, you know, Nigerians. So it is not easy to sort of discard that or substitute them under any other platform, except to work collaboratively with NIMSI, you know, taking forward. So as we are rolling out, as ANEC is rolling out this new, you know, uh, next move about the registration, all the various requirements that NIMSI will require will be folded into the INEX uh, capture of the new revalidation um, validation of uh, you know, new voters you know, going forward as from next year. Uh, because, so that would be uh, one way of harmonizing you know, okay. uh, some of the ideas with what uh, NIMSI would like to see happen. Okay, so it then means that with the process of uh, having to, if I own a car now or I need to renew my driver's license, I have to register for driver's license. If I need to get international passport, I need uh, first and foremost to get a national ID card before I can get the uh, international passport. Then I need to also queue again for the voter, reg uh, vo 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 voter register. Because in some other climes, there is just in America that we are watching the election now, you just need your national, you just need an ID to get to vote. There is a specified ID to vote. So why can't we get to that point? How difficult is it? Well, uh, it, is, um, it, is, it is difficult why you need to make sure that you have the proper legal framework that allows an agency that has the mandate, like NIMSI, to take that forward. Until we get that sorted out and then it is working, Unfortunately, we're going to have all this disparate, uh, you know, system competing in the space going forward. And even in the U.S., it is not all that one in, in any case. The only thing that is common in the U.S. is that they have a national, you know, the social security number that is common across, which is not even an ID because it doesn't carry your picture, just a number. But uh, every state has to have their own different uh, driver's license. And for various other, you know, uh, subsystems, they have different uh, identity, you know, card uh, system. But the common thing is that all those identity card systems in the U.S. will require, the, you must have, 
the name, their 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 national, you know, uh, the, the 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 number that they give to you. You know, you must have that because that is common across. across. And I think that is the direction in which uh, Nipsey is going. But have the name card, you know, uh, number. So if I want to, for example, now for a first-time voter of someone who do not have um, uh, the, vo uh, the voter uh, card now, uh, if such a person wants to get one, uh, what, do you, what, what do you need to get, to, get uh, to, uh, to grab a voter card? Well, if you present yourself to get uh, the INEC uh, PVC, you have to be able to have a form of identification. Perhaps you are a student. And so you can come with your student university ID card, something to identify you that shows your date of birth. You probably want to have uh, something that comes from your local government as a form of identification, something that shows who you are and what your date is. I mean, those are basic fundamental requirements. So you should have that. And Nigerians have been doing that anyway. That's how we got to the number of having about 84 million in the annex database as we currently have. So what we are doing now is just going forward and getting those people who are now who are 18 years and older or those who have not had the card previously up to the point in which we are resetting you know, the, this uh, recapture of uh, people with, uh, to get on the PVC going forward. Okay, so uh, before we get into the issue of diaspora voting and all of that, uh, because all of these are uh, hinged on uh, the, the process of lawmaking and amendment, uh, what is the update and what is the latest? What are you hearing from the National Assembly? Because they are working on updating and amending the Electoral Act. What is the level of progress in that? Well, I can speak uh, what I know is happening at the commission level. The commission has done extensive review and ready and prepared documentation to indicate areas that will require some further legislative work on the part of the National Assembly. All that is ready and being submitted to the National Assembly. It's now left the National Assembly to set the ball rolling. And we have some good news today at the National Assembly at the Senate level, where the Chairman of the Senate Committee on ANEC was saying that they are going to take that on very soon. I mean, it looks like a matter of weeks, the way he spoke. So I think everybody should be hopeful, including the country as well as INEC, that this is going to happen. But definitely, he did say that this will happen, this will be ha this will happen in good time before the next uh, general election. Well, hopefully, it will happen you know, sometime early in the next year. But the way he spoke today shows that National, I mean, National Assembly, Senate in particular, is ready to take this uh, electoral reform on, on board as quickly as possible. So that was good okay. news. So because we are, uh, one of the conversations we'll be having in the coming days is how far the National Assembly had gone because we on, uh, when we had a, a conversation with members of the National Assembly, they gave us a deadline and we'll be following up on that. But uh, let's talk uh, about the diaspora voting first and foremost. What model are you using? Um, can anyone carry two uh, uh, identities and uh, uh, two passports, can they vote in Nigeria or vote in the Nigerian election? In this, your diaspora uh, voting plan. So that's, that, that is a bit of a, a tricky question. I think that is a, a legal question that should be trashed out at the time of the electoral reform. So INEC, as an implementer of the electoral process, we have to await what the law says that is permissible to be done under the legal framework. So whatever the requirements are, whether dual citizenship, like what I think you are inferring to, like being a U.S. citizen and being Nigerian, which I think is a permissible thing in our climate, you know, right now, whether that, that will be tweaked or it will remain the same, it will be a requirement for diaspora voting, or whether there will be a variant, because there are, so very models, there are so very many models of diaspora voting that is happening there, you know, across the globe, even near us here in Niger Republic, they do diaspora voting within Nigeria and outside of Nigeria, have diaspora constituency, there are so many variants that can be used. So again, we are conversing a number of this, but it's left to the legislature to decide which variant perfectly suits Nigeria. Whatever is in the law is what INEC is going to take forward. So one of the other areas that was raised by the INEC chairman is the issue of early voting. Uh, as we see, uh, American system, they use the mail, uh, uh, using the, mold, the, early, uh, the, the early voting process where they put their, their voting via mails. Uh, what model are you hoping that we work for Nigeria? Is that something also that you're thinking? or uh, this is going to be based on electronic voting. I know we had this conversation with you, Dr. Lecky, and you said, look, using technology is the right way to go in our electoral process. Well, technology and the issue of early voting, uh, there are two 
separate but related issue. I think we're all living witnesses now what is happening in America because it's happening as we speak. And we can see the challenges with even early voting and the country that we hold into high esteem as uh, models. We are seeing things that are unraveling, which uh, we would not have even expected. The contestations about early voting, whether they should be counted, when they should be counted, how they should be counted, they will be set aside. And so we are learning a lot of lessons. I don't think that some of the lessons and things we are showing playing around now are the things that we want to do. Clearly, it is good that this is happening before our eyes, even before we go on to reform our you know, legal framework so that we can take some of the bad, the good things and you know, straight away some of the bad things that we are seeing playing uh, for people or clients that we think were role model that we should be, you know, we should be, you know, adopting. So there are good lessons. So we need to really point that and look at all these things, analyze them and take them on board and go to the legislature to do, you know, the right thing for us. So the issue of early voting or, you know, uh, mailing ballots, papers and stuff like that, or, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, email voting, all these sort of things, we are seeing them playing as so we are going to learn a lot of lessons from there. I'm sure that our National Assembly members are looking at what is playing in America because we also run a presidential system of government and then we are going to learn a lot of things from there. I don't think some of the things we are seeing playing now are the things that are very good, you know, to hear about. And so it's good that it's happening and we can learn from it. Okay, so uh, as regarding electronic voting, how would that p uh, pan out? What, are the, what is the thinking of INEC internally on uh, the way to go? Well, you know, INEC has been steadily deploying ICT technology in the electoral process. Everybody is very familiar. We have an electronic register, which is the largest database, electronic database in Africa and one of the biggest in the world, 84 million and counting. Clearly, it's an electronic database. We have the PVC, the permanent voter card, which has a chip in it, which is electronic. We have the smart card reader. We now have the zip pack with which we upload, you know, uh, PU level uh, results that everybody is viewing, everybody is uh, healing INEC form. So these are all continuum of services, IC service that INEC has been deploying. So what, we are, what INEC is going into now is to look at to do e-balloting, you know, which is electronic voting machines deployment in our election. It's a major step. And the current uh, available legal framework allows INEC to be the one to determine what method it deploys, you know, and how it deploys it for election. So there will be no need for specific legislation on that. But there are aspects of the legislature which needs to be tweaked further that doesn't compete with what we can do with electronic voting. So INEC is moving towards, you know, bringing that about, like I think in one of our discussions earlier, in terms of time scale, INEC is looking at some time around the um, uh, November next year when the Anambra elections took place to actually we have got it to a point where the EVM, the, that is the electronic voting machine for e-balloting, can begin to be used in our election. So that is what uh, I think INEC is moving towards, Edouard. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mustafa Leki, ANEC National Commissioner. Thank you so much for talking to us about some of this plan. And we do hope that uh, as soon as INEC is ready and you have a date for the continual voter registration for next year, do let us know. I would like to tell you that the American election is hang hanging in the balance. No winner just yet. We're looking at the numbers coming in and some of the uh, states that are yet to be uh, totally counted to determine uh, the collegiate votes and, of course, the total vote uh, to determine the next president of the United States. But that's how we leave it, everyone, on the program tonight. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Sean Akimale. Bye for now.